this factory is owned by Joe and this factory is owned by Sam. All right. Joe says, you know what? Let's keep making widgets. And in 120 to 160 days, this factory becomes dilapidated. And then over here, 120 days, the factory reproduces itself and makes a new factory that makes widgets for Joe. Okay? Sam owns this factory. Okay? And he says, you know what? If I can produce, now let's just put it this way. He makes 100 widgets per day. Okay? Sam down here owns the other factory. He says, you know what? I know I can produce 100 units of widgets, same thing, 100 units of widgets a day. But I got a wife who likes jewelry and three kids. That ain't enough. Okay? He says, I tell you what. Let's build two more factories, each one making widgets, 100 widgets a day. Okay, Sam says, but wait a minute, I also have a girlfriend. Let's make another factory, another factory, 100 units of widgets a day. Expensive girlfriend. Yeah. <laughs> and, his daughter got knocked up, <laughs> gonna have a baby, so we're making two new 100 widgets a day, 100 widgets a day. Okay, who is going to make more widgets, first off? Sam. Who's gonna make more money? Sam, right? Mm -hmm. Now, what is generating, okay, the reproduction of the factory. This factory runs out of gas, is dilapidated, we make a new factory. What's controlling the factory production here? Sam and his financial dilemmas. Okay? Mm -hmm. Change that now. This is the HPV virus. Hmm. This is the HPV virus, not widgets anymore. Okay? Mm -hmm. Now, HPV virus that is J, okay, again, he does not know there are the switches for cellular reproduction to be turned on. Doesn't know where it is. So he has to wait till the cell dies and a new cell is produced so he can make more HPV. This virus knows where the switch is for cellular reproduction and starts causing cellular reproduction to occur. Now, I go back to this because it's, it's really important to get the concept here. In J, or Joe's system of HPV, who is controlling cellular reproduction? The cell, the body. In this situation, in Sam, who's controlling cellular reproduction? Okay, guess what? What do you call this? Cancer. No, you call this dysplasia. Abnormal cellular growth that is caused because now the virus has taken over and it's causing the cells to reproduce. And each one of those cells has an atypical nucleus because it has HPV indoctrinated into it. It's being reproduced as well. Okay? First thing, got that. Okay. This guy, low risk, HPV. This guy's high risk HPV. Okay? Number two concept. If this stuff continues to make new cells, till eventually these cells break off and start making their own systems of cells, okay, what do we call it then? We call it cancer. Those cells have lost control of the mothership. They've been doing their own thing out there. Cancer. Got it so far? Mm -hmm. That's what you need to know about HPV. Now, we're gonna put it into perspective. The body comes in 
and wants to fight the virus. Okay? We took four of those, right? So we're gonna put four in here. Who has a better chance of winning the war? The guys fighting this guy or the guys fighting this guy? The, the low risk. Thing. Right. And for example, the more active, the more active the cells are in their life cycle, okay, the more virus they can produce, correct? Okay, the cells on the, f on the bottom of your foot, how many days does it take one cell to die and a new cell replace it? Through the life cycle, 120 to 160 days? Okay. So, does body have time to attack the virus, whether high risk or low risk, in a cell that's not reproducing a lot and doesn't have the mechanism to create a bunch of new cells because it's not very active? So does the body have time to attack it? That's why when you get a wart on your foot or on your finger, unless you are immunosuppressed, it's usually localized, it's walled off, and you treat it with some medicine and it goes away. What is, in a woman, the most reproductively, wrong terminology, the most metabolically active cells, quote, on the outside of her body? Cervix. Her cervix, why? Every single day, it's changing based on her hormone values. It goes from a squamous cell to more of a glandular cell. It produces water, then it produces mucus. There's metaplasia going on constantly. So the body has no time if a high-risk virus attacks it. The body doesn't have time to fight it. And that's why it has the ability to develop cancer because the body is overwhelmed because the virus is in a factory that has all the parts it needs and it can go crazy. And that's what this is all about. So let's, let's put that into perspective for a second. If I'm telling you that the HPV virus is going to hit the cervix because it is metabolically active and the virus says, wow, this is a fertile place to make more viruses because that's all I want to do really. And I'm going to turn these cells on and make them reproduce. So I'm going to cause dysplasia, etc." Then prior to menarche or when hormones start coming to the cervix and start changing for reproduction, the risk of HPV at the cervix is minimal because it's no different than her foot. When else would it be that way? After menopause. So after menopause, yeah, you can get HPV. It's no different than your foot because the cervix does not have any increased metabolic activity. If the cervix is gone, the vagina doesn't have the same metabolic activity. So the risk of HPV goes down, okay? So, why now is the instruction saying, well, let's not worry about really young girls because prior to menarche, for the first period, why are we even worried? They're no different. They're exposed to it. And after menopause, but how long before someone gets exposed to the high-risk HPV in a normal patient that's reproductive age, how long before exposure to cancer production in the average cervix of a someone who gets this disease process? Anybody ever read anything about that? It should be like, I think like seven or more years than that, right? Risk says seven to 10 years, okay? The average age of menopause is what? 51. 51. So add 10 years to that. 
So somebody said, okay, after age 65, why are we doing pap smears anymore? Yeah, they might have HPV, but what's the risk of cancer? Minimal. Body can fight it. Under the age of, let's say, 10-ish, we don't even do it. Under the age of sexual activity, we're, we don't do them either. Okay? I'm not in favor of waiting till they're 21, but that's a different story altogether. But supposedly, up to the age of 21, they don't want you to do pap smears. Why? Body can just fight it off. Really good at I don't agree with that. That's what they're telling you. What's the real reason? Sounds like a good reason, doesn't it? What do you think the real reason is? You just gave it to me. If it takes seven, ten years to develop severe disease, what are you going to pick up at someone who just became sexually active at 18? You might find mild dysplasia or high-risk HPV, but do you want to do anything before it becomes severe disease? Well, I, I think that we're getting away from preventative medicine, so I'm not going to get into that speech with you. With you. But that's why the literature is saying now wait to 21 to start screening them. Okay? Make sense? Okay. So, dude. Okay, now this is we're going to take. I gotta draw my football field. I keep doing it that way, and then I forget the rest of the field. Okay, so what we do is we make two end zones. Okay, we're talking about the squamous cells of the cervix. One end zone has normal cells, the other end zone is cancer. Okay. In between that, virus attacks, starts forcing the cells to start making viruses. So they start making viruses, and we call that mild changes or mild dysplasia, also known as CIN1. Okay? Now, as the cells start making new cells, and the virus is generating those new cells, we call that moderate dysplasia and severe dysplasia. CIN2, CIN3. Show you something interesting. We also know that mild dysplasia, okay, and if you want to draw something in here, yeah, like this that you can call atypia, okay? Doesn't really, just show some atypical cells. So, if you take a step backwards, now remember, we called this whole thing in here, to here, dysplasia, which only means abnormal cell growth, right? Doesn't mean anything else, doesn't mean cancer, doesn't mean anything, okay? Abnormal cell growth with atypical nuclei. Mild disease, okay, is caused, okay, by the virus that can't produce the cells, okay, can only produce viruses. So somebody one day said, you know what, let's call this low-grade SIL, and let's call this high-grade SIL, SI, SIL. High grade squamous intraepithelial lesion. Why? Because these guys are caused by the fact that those cells are aggressive and can make cells reproduce themselves. So, another way to group that down here, okay, would be high risk HPV caused and low risk HPV cause. Begin to see how they got to this point. Mm -hmm. And what they discovered is the body has time to fix these. So 50% of these stay in the low risk cat, I mean in the low grade disease. And the rest of the 50% get better on their own. Here, though, 
50% stay right where they are, about 30% go this way, and about 20% go that way. And over here, 75% stay, and the rest of them pretty much go that way. It's about 23%, and they say maybe 2% go backwards, but it's rare. So, one other point to this before I get to the next step for you. If you take this, I'm gonna use a different color, so it's not to confuse you. This is surface epithelium, okay? And this is basement membrane. Okay? And you draw a line, it kind of looks like this. And then you say, okay, purple. Okay? Purple are atypical cells that the virus has stimulated growth to. So when you see these cells making their way up to the surface, like that, that's how this is defined histologically. So what they look for is one third of the level, mild dysplasia. If the atypical cells go up to two thirds, then it's moderate dysplasia. If you see atypical cells in the epithelium going all the way to the surface or down one third, that's severe dysplasia. Once they break through the cervix, through the surface, then it's cancer. Okay? And distal spread. Got it so far? Okay. Now, is uh, by the surface, you mean like uh... the skin? The, the surface of the skin, okay, gotcha, gotcha. whether it's cervix, whether it's skin, whatever it is, it's squamous epithelium we're talking about. Okay, so knowing what I just showed you, okay, and looked at the data that I just gave you, do you think it is worthwhile to try to treat low-grade disease? Why not? It doesn't have a high risk of progressing to cancer. Correct. And? 50% of the time it gets well, I'm assuming. Okay. And why does that occur? <clears throat> because most of it's called by the low risk HPV. Okay. What about moderate dysplasia? Do you think it's worth treating? Probably. These guys, what's got to worry you? 20 and 23% get worse. If that's your wife, your daughter, or your patient, doesn't that scare you? Because you also know that that's caused by what? The more aggressive, high-risk HPV. So, how do we treat that? Easy enough. The first thing we do is diagnose it. How do you diagnose the pathology here. You take a colposcopy. Now, have you seen a colposcopy in the office? You think I didn't see any? I've seen it on YouTube, but not the office. Okay. <laughs> Basically, all it is is looking at the cervix with a microscope. That's all it is. It's no big thing. Here's your cervix. And here's the cervical os. Okay? Here is... Um, what I want to show you. This is looking at it in cross section, okay? And I'm going to do it this way because there's a cervical os, right? And then like that, that's the uterine cavity, okay? And I'll do this. That's the vaginal wall, okay? And we're running out of spaces to put things. <laughs> Here is a uterus, okay? Now, what type of tissue lines here? It's a glandular epithelium, correct? Okay. What type of lining is here? It's a squamous epithelium, right? 
Okay, are we all on the same page? Okay. Glands are on the inside, squamous on the outside. Now, somewhere these two have to come together. The glands have to meet the squamous. Correct? Well, when the first half of the menstrual cycle, when women are trying to get ready to get pregnant, they have high levels of what? Estrogen. Estrogen wants to facilitate a person allowing the sperm to get into the uterus and a healthy uterine glandular environment so that that fertilized egg can implant in it, correct? So there is a metaplasia that occurs that allows this glandular tissue to progress further down. It doesn't move. The cells go through metaplasia based on estrogen. Once a person gets pregnant after ovulation, correct, what hormone is now produced? Progesterone, right? The theca cells stop producing estrogen and the granulosa cells start producing more of a progesterone. Mm -hmm. And now the uterus says she's already pregnant or she's getting pregnant. So what do I want to do? I need to protect against bacteria, viruses, and other sperm. So I'm going to cause metaplasia to get rid of the glandular tissue and make it squamous. And then it goes through the cycle again. Make sense? Mm -hmm. So this area right here where all this occurs at is called the transition zone. Why is it called the transition zone? We just explained it. It's changing constantly. Okay. Take your step backwards for a second. What did I tell you was the reason for the virus causing dysplasia in the cervix? The more active the cells are metabolizing, the higher risk of disease. So if you had to put those two pieces together, where's the highest risk if you're looking for dysplasia to occur on the cervix? Transition. The transition zone, absolutely. So. With colposcopy, what we want to do is look at that zone, and if you look at a person on birth control pills with estrogen in it, okay, or a woman in the first half of her cycle who's not using any hormones, what you see is an area like this, and this area is very red. It's glandular, and outside of this is squamous tissue, okay? So you take a microscope and you look at it. As cells become more dysplastic, I shouldn't say cells, the tissue becomes more dysplastic. So these factories are further away from the basement membrane and actually filling all, because it's not just there, these things are all the way down in all that tissue. So it's not just the surface, okay? There's so many of these cells, first off, what does a factory need in order to produce viruses? Energy. Huh? Energy. Energy and what else? Nutrients. It needs a supply chain, correct? Okay, so remember, we're looking at this as the surface, this is the, and I'm gonna do it this way for you so it helps you a little bit, because I want these two things to look the same. This is, this tissue is a little more glandular, Right? Mm -hmm. So it looks like this, okay? So, I look at this area, and the first thing I see right here is an area that is white. Now, when does it turn white? Okay, the first thing I wanna do is say, what does a dysplastic cell, what makes it dysplastic? Makes the cell itself dysplastic. It has enlarged nuclear tissue because the virus is incorporated into the nucleus. And you have big, bulky chromosomal nuclei. So what happens to the relationship between the cytoplasm to the nucleus? 
you have less cytoplasm per amount of nucleus, correct? So, let's get smart for a second. Say, okay, if I know that, if I take hypertonic solution, and we use 3% acetic acid, also known as vinegar, and we dab it onto the surface here, water leaves the cells. If there's already a large nuclei to cytoplasmic ratio, that cell, you're only gonna see more nuclear material, so it's gonna look white. And that's what acetal-white's all about. That's all it is. It's tissue with hypermetabolic nuclei and large nuclei for the process that we're calling viral disease here, okay? And when you cause an osmotic gradient to come out, but those cells look whiter than the other tissue. Okay? First off, so that is the acetal-white that you see. Then, the nutrient supply train. In the tissue, blood vessels, I'm going to do it <coughs> in orange, okay? The blood vessels run down here, like this, all right? And here's where the disease is. This is where we have our white tissue. I'm gonna draw that. I'm gonna, I can't draw for you, but I'm gonna do it like this, a bubble, okay? That's this area right here. It doesn't look like that, but it's the best I can do to show you. Blood vessels via a neovascularization hormone that these cells produce to get more blood supply to them and for blood vessels. So the blood vessels go up and come back down again, up, up, like that, to supply this dysplastic tissue. Well, when you look at the tissue, what do you see? You just see the tips of these. So, when you look at this, you see something called punctation. All that is are hairpin vessels going up, coming back down, supplying the tissue. Then what happens as the disease gets worse, these guys begin to branch out to each other and connect. So when you look at it here, what you begin to see are blood vessels that go between the tissue and divide these white plaques into mosaic tiles. So we call that mosaicism. And as the tissue gets worse, these things coalesce together and get thicker and thicker. So when you get big, thick blood vessels in that tissue, now you gotta be worrying about a big, severe dysplastic to cancer changes. See the progression? Make sense? So what do you do? Well, the first thing you do is you take a biopsy of that. And if you don't see anything, you can scrape the canal in here, this area, to make sure you're not missing something. It's called an ECC, an endocervical curette. So the biopsy comes back after the pathologist looks on the microscope and says you have CIN2 or CIN3. Now you're gonna treat it, okay? When you look at it from this perspective, you know that the area that has to be treated is basically here to here, right? because that's gonna incorporate that transition zone, correct? Mm -hmm. When you look at it from this perspective though, it looks like this, because remember, you gotta go down the canal too. It's two-dimensional or three-dimensional. So when you put this together with this, it comes out looking like a cone, and that's a conization. Make sense? Mm -hmm. So the treatment now is a loop electrical excisional conization called a LEAP. Years ago, we froze them. We cauterized them with, I used to use lasers. We used to use bovies. Um, I remember using a CO2 laser for a long time for these. The problem with that is we didn't get biopsy results. All we got was um, tissue. Oh, we didn't get tissue, we just, it just vaporized. And then we got to cold conizations, where you took and actually did a knife into this. They bled a lot, and you had to take more tissue that way, and there was more destruction. 
So the LEAP really has become the standard of treatment now for these. Once you do that, then you set them up on a follow-up protocol on how to follow that disease process based on the final pathology from your LEAP. Okay? Mm -hmm. Make sense? Now what you're seeing though is a lot of confusion. So if we know this now, there's a couple ways that we can approach this. If all we do to begin with is test for these guys. So if she doesn't have any HPV, and we know that 99% of dysplastic changes of the cervix are caused by HPV, do you need to do a pap smear? Possibly not. If she has low risk HPV, but not high risk HPV, are you worried about disease? Probably not. So some people have suggested, let's start by screening everybody with HPV instead of a pap smear. Once you come back with high risk HPV, now you start doing pap smears. Now, interesting concept. One pap smear, okay? I never get these terms right, so I'm gonna say it the way they make sense to me, okay? How sensitive in terms of positive predictive value does one a, um, pap smear tell you? So let me say it this way. If it comes back and says there is no disease, how accurate is it? One pap smear. I think that's actually negative predictive value, isn't it? I always get those mixed up, so. How accurate is it? One pap smear. I have no idea. Any idea? 75%. Guess? Okay, we'll take a guess. 76%. Really in the 80s? 50%. 50%. If you do a second pap smear on the same person and it comes back negative for any pathology, how accurate is the combined two pap smears? Probably more than 50, right? 75%. If you do three pap smears and they all come back negative, how accurate is that result? 85. 98. 98%. So three pap smears in a row are very good that the patient doesn't have any process going on. If someone comes back with high risk HPV, okay, and normal cells on pap smear, so there's no dysplasia. So it's a normal epithelium. But you have high risk HPV. Do you need to recheck high risk HPV again? No, you already know you have it. So how are you gonna follow that lady? Well, why not just do pap smear? Because as long as you keep doing them, the more you do that are negative, the more reassuring it is. And if one comes back positive, then you start the process of diagnosis. Some people would like to suggest that if you have high risk HPV and a normal pap smear, you should do colposcopy. Well, how accurate is colposcopy in a normal pap smear for screening the cervix? Very low. How good is it in diagnosing things when there is an abnormality there? Very good, because you know you're looking for something that's gotta be there somewhere. There are some doctors which have bastardized this in my mind, and what they'll do is they'll take a patient in the office who high risk HPV and a negative pap smear, and they'll do four quadrant biopsies of the cervix and an ECC. Well, what if they missed it? Did that tell them anything? No, the pap smear is more accurate for screening that patient. Once they get to the CIN2 to CIN3, but they're not read that way anymore. Now, with the Bethesda classification, they're only read as LGSIL or HGSIL. If a patient comes back with low-grade SIL 
and low-risk HPV, you can follow them with pap smears. If they come back with low-grade SIL, high-grade SIL, then, and they're high-risk HPV, then you need to screen them with colposcopy. Excuse me for one second. Dr. Sarowski. Yeah. Yes, I'm here. Uh, I'll be in in a few minutes. I'll check her, okay? Thank you. Bye-bye. Um, I have a patient that I have to one on one time, so I'm going to cut you guys off early tonight. So. Um, so, if she comes back with CIN2 or CIN3 with either HPV, you need to look at the cervix to make sure there isn't anything else going on. Does that make sense? Make sense to you? Mm -hmm. Good. I hope this helps. Thank you. You're welcome. I hope the lectures have helped you. I apologize having to cut you short a little bit tonight. Um, but I always think this is a fun conversation because you're getting bombarded with people telling you different ways to do this. I think the worst thing we're doing to women is saying we don't need to see them as often because we don't need pap smears. That's how they're interpreting it. And their health is dropping to ours. We have terrible health care because you only go to the doctor when you're sick. You don't do any screening. When's the last time you just, other than required for school, <laughs> when's the last time you went to your doctor? just for the sake of going. Women go every year. Why? Because they want to check for breast disease, cervical disease. They thought a pap smear was what they did every year. Now they're saying, I don't have to do that anymore. Oh, guess what? Now we're getting young girls coming in with cancer. There was a study out the other day that was presented in the general literature that said that there is a sudden rise in young girls with severe disease to cancer under the age of 21. Why do you think that's occurring? What do you think the, the major reason for that is? They're sexually active at a younger age. Okay, but why is it all of a sudden developing? Because we're not screening them. That's my argument. That's exactly what I think is true. What do you think their argument was? Um, probably an epidemic sense. There's more access to health care now with the Affordable <laughs> Care Act. So we're picking it up. No, we're waiting until it gets worse, then we're picking it up. That's why we're not seeing it in low-grade diseases now. You guys are in for a treat as medicine <laughs> progresses. I'm going to go take care of this patient. Thanks, guys. I hope it helped you. Thank you. Thank you. And I hope you enjoyed your rotation. Oh, I did. Good. And uh, did people listen to those recordings? Were they worthwhile? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Thank you.